I saw at Air Force that they figured out how to win with what you got. They would figure out a way through leadership to win with what they got. They would put us in situations where they would facilitate our positives and negate our negatives. So when you sit there and go, well, you didn't give me X, Y, or Z, so we lost. No, my expectation is we'll work to get what you need, but the expectation is still you win with what you got. Welcome to Long Blue Leadership, presented by the U.S. Air Force Academy Association and Foundation. Your host for this edition of Long Blue Leadership is Dr. Doug Lindsay, USAFA class of 92, speaker, author, leadership consultant, and currently serving the Center for Character and Leadership Development as executive editor of the Journal of Character and Leadership Development. And now, Dr. Doug Lindsay. My guest today is Lieutenant General Retired Bradford J. Schwedo, USAFA class of 1987. General Schwedo leads the Air Force Academy's Institute for Future Conflict as its first director. Throughout our conversation, you'll hear us refer to the Institute as the IFC. General Schwedo was named to the position in March 2021 by Academy Superintendent General Richard Clark. The IFC is preparing cadets to wage and win wars in non-traditional domains. As we progress through our conversation with General Schwedo, you will quickly understand why he was chosen to lead this pioneering institution where future think informs everything they do. The general graduated from the academy with a bachelor's in military history while also lettering in football. His career led him into an intelligence space, beginning with an assignment at Goodfellow Air Force Base in Texas in 1989, then Germany and Saudi Arabia. He served as threat manager with the 487th Intelligence Group from 1993 to 1995. He moved to the Pentagon as Offensive Information Warfare Chief in 1995. Between 1998 and 2020, he spent time in Korea, several assignments at CIA headquarters in Virginia, at Buckley Air Force Base here in Colorado, and several more assignments at the Pentagon. He served in multiple command and leadership positions, and at one point was in charge of four directorates supporting 77,000 personnel, global cyber operations, and assets valued at $17 billion. He is a consummate warrior, logistician, strategist, and leader. General Schwedo, welcome to Long Blue Leadership. Thanks so much. It's an honor of mine. Thanks a lot. Appreciate Glad to have for me. having me. Absolutely. Um, let's uh, let's start kind of at the beginning, if we, if we can. Uh, it seems like from an early age that you had a competitive streak. And um, can you talk a little bit behind uh, that background and that upbringing? Yeah. So I will tell you, I was uh, very, very pleased when uh, the Air Force came knocking and uh, it started with football, as you, you brought up. And um, I was recruited as a high schooler to come out here and play. And I think as what you were talking about about my earlier career, I think I'm very much a product of the academy across the board. It's not just one single piece. And one of the larger ones, though, was uh, football. And uh, quite honestly, and we'll talk about history because that, that was very much one. And then different comms programs, also big influences. But um, – Coming here to play football, it was amazing to me. Um, there were uh, so many great athletes. I wasn't one of them. But um, it was amazing to me. Every Saturday, we would go out there and we'd look at these guys that any layman would say, there's no way these guys are going to win. And I learned a lot about leadership and a lot about you know, capabilities and competitions in Falcon Stadium. And I saw at Air Force that they figured out how to win with what you got. They would figure out a way through leadership to win with what they got. They would put us in situations and individual athletes where they would facilitate our positives and negate our negatives. Um, that competitive streak, all of that background in Falcon Stadium was priceless. I mean, I learned a lot both playing and coaching on how to do that. And once again, that reflects greatly on the people in the Department of Athletics who every day have to do exactly what I witnessed but what a great life lesson for when after you graduate and you're no lie defending the country, we expect you to win with what you got. It's a no-fail mission, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And what a great training ground, uh, you know, to kind of lick, lick your wounds when you, you didn't get the right lesson. But on game day, I felt like we were always there. We always understood what we needed to do. And we put those people in the right places so we could win that day. So you realized that kind of as you went through football and as you were coaching and doing that, but before that, when the academy did 
come knocking or what was it that intrigued you about it? Obviously the opportunity to play football. What was your thought process of that whole idea of saying, yeah, I'm gonna go out to Colorado and I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. And there's that service component as yeah, well. That's there. I, I think the one thing that really impressed me about it, uh, the Air Force Academy and, and uh, they still do this, they sell you on the whole program. You know, there are some, uh, some places where, and I was getting recruited from other schools where they're just focusing on the football or whatever. And what I loved about the Air Force Academy was they sold you the whole package. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, I encourage cadets when I meet with them, think of this place as a buffet because there's lots of things you don't know the Air Force does that is really, really cool. And my biggest problem was I wanted to do everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wanted to be a pilot, I wanted to be an astronaut, I wanted to be a combat controller, I wanted to be an intelligence officer. I wanted All of those things were really cool. Mm -hmm. And when I tell the cadets, Look, I know what you want to do right now, but think of this place as a buffet. You don't just sit down and eat one thing, sample all of those things, and you rapidly find out there's lots of different things that you may want to do. And that's kind of the way I've been through my career is, you know, wow, that's really cool, or that I'd like to do that, and been very lucky to be able to pounce on a lot of those opportunities. Being open to the process and kind of trusting the process that there's something here that we're going to we're, we're looking out for you. I always thought that was kind of nice in my 22 years that there was always someone there looking out for me, protecting me from myself, so to speak, of, hey, you need to go here at this time and you need to do that, even though it wasn't quite the vector I wanted to go. It was still a, a, probably the best one at the right time. It is things you do for the team that doesn't always you know, align with what you want to do, but in the long run was absolutely the right, right call. Right. And you mentioned the team, right? That's that's something I think that, that I learned as well, kind of going through this. It felt very much when I would fail a GR or a test or something, <laughs> it was very much me, but it was always kind of in the context of something larger about, yeah. about the team. And that's where it, that always felt like I was going through it alone, but I really wasn't because there was all these other people a, a, around me. No, you're exactly right. What else really resonated that set you up for to success when you got on active well, duty? Well, you know, on the um, academic side, I felt well prepared um, for what I was about to jump into. And, uh, you know, military history for me was, you know, exactly what I wanted to do. There's a old uh, uh, Bismarck um, quote that says, only fools learn from their mistakes. Wise men fool, you know, learn from other people's mistakes. Absolutely spot on. And that's kind of what dragged me to military history because I was like, you know, there's a lot of life lessons there. And, you know, it, it was reading that I really enjoyed. Also within the academics, you know, a long, long time ago, we studied about the Soviet Union and World War III and all of those things. And as you said, I went to Intel school in 89, but I rapidly found myself in 1990 in Desert Shield. And all of those things that I had studied, uh, because the Iraqis used a lot of the Soviet uh, organized, train and equip structures, I knew what they were doing before. So I had been studying it here. So I felt really well prepared by the time Desert Storm started. And then that started kicking me off, you know, in the right, uh, right direction. I always felt a little unsettled at the academy because it was always pulling me to do different things, not just be stuck in my lane, but learn that there are other lanes out there and that I can actually be in that lane and be okay, you know, whether it's academics or military or athletics. And I think there's something to that idea of not just letting people be a little unbalanced mm -hmm. um, and being comfortable with that in terms of being able to figure out where they need to be or, or exactly. what they need to do. Does that fit in with oh, you, what you're talking you're about? You're exactly right. And, you know, everybody jokes about the GRs and the quizzes and knowing where you're going to take a hit here and you're going to focus on that. As I talked about Siri, that was not comfortable, but you kind of sucked it up. But um, first of all, you know, dealing with cadets in this job is the most humbling experience of my life. They are so much smarter than I ever was. And, you know, it's, it's really humbling and it's an honor to do that. But they fire, you know, evil questions back at you and all of these. And it's actually really fun to answer those questions. So a lot of them will go, you know, I'm learning all this stuff that's not applicable and blah, blah, blah. And they'll ask me questions. So um, when I was doing cyber um, on the joint staff, we have these things called deputies committee meetings and principal committee meetings. And those are either chaired by the principal, is chaired by the president or National Security Council. And when you walk in, they are underwhelming conference rooms in the West Wing of the White House, I can assure you. 
And uh, at a principal's committee meeting, you have a secretary of defense, the secretary of state, secretary of treasury, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And sometimes when it would come to cyber um, or frequencies, you know, different uh, election security, mm-hmm. they'd go, BJ, you take the meeting. So I would go. And, you know, the first time I walked in the West Wing of the White House, it was a significant emotional event. But back to the cadets. Um, I have told them a hundred times, you know, when you go in there, first of all, you better be prepared. You better do all the studies. So all of these things that we do to cram is not a bad thing. But the next piece is I've told them numerous times, some of the things that I learned in Colorado Springs carried the day in West Wing discussions because I remember studying those things and, well, you're forgetting this portion of their history or you're forgetting this piece. And um, often, I'm sure you had it when you were running around, cadets are like, oh, when will I ever use this? Actually, you will. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly so. That's right. I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you, yes, you will. <laughs> well, so thinking about that idea of, of being in the West Wing and being there and being tapped to say, hey, you're the guy, you're successful at that point at the highest levels. But at some point, there's that idea that you're the person, right? You're the one that's got to be able to speak and articulate in that way. What was that like the first time you kind of went through that? <laughs> it's process? very humbling. And, you know, first of all, you look down at these stars, you're like, where the hell did these come from? Because <laughs> you, you do still feel like you're a cadet, you know, 24-7. And um, honestly, when you walk into these rooms, um, you know the seriousness of the situation. By that time, you know most of the people around the table. And um, you know you're prepared. Uh, they will give you three ring binders. And I tell the cadets this. I'm like, look, you know, the world is not. And we, we've had cadets come and they go, you know, what's all this Hamas and, um, you know, uh, Israeli thing? Because our squadron's kind of split. Mm-hmm. And I go, guys, I go, um, I know you're in an academic situation. So you think things are either right or wrong. But the world is grays. Talking to the the cadets, I was, we went through the history of, you know, the Middle East and all of that. And they're kind of drooling because it's been 20 minutes. And I go, by the way, that three ring binder, that's the first tab. And if you haven't read everything in that binder, you're going to get mauled in this situation. And I go, you know, the next piece is, and we, we went back and forth where there wasn't, you know, there were so many grays ex- associated with it. And I go, now, when you get up from that conference table, you're gonna walk out and the people waiting to talk about the border are there, Ukraine are there, you know, and it is a conga line of problems that, that they deal with every day. And I go, by the way, you better be well-versed on all of those too. And, you know, when they see that, it is that transition to, from an academic situation where it's right and wrong to what we're gonna dump them into the grays. And I think they do see that's where some of these applicable situations that they had in Colorado Springs may come back. Um, once again, uh, is it a GR or a quiz? Okay, well, a quiz is going to die. All right, do there. And I'm not too proud to tell you that speed reading is a good thing. And uh, they will drive you from the river entrance at the Pentagon and drop you off in front of the White House. And by the way, as soon as you get back from the White House, there's another meeting waiting for you on another thing that you better be prepared for. So um, this whole thing, there's a method, I think, to the Academy's madness when they start throwing all this stuff at you. Makes me think, so you kind of come out as a military history major. So really more, here's what was done to uh, here's what's going on to here's kind of what it looks like in the future. What, what do you think it was that appealed to you? In that I, I, was, I was very lucky and, um, you know, uh, came out of Desert Storm and I knew I was too dumb to get a master's on my own. <laughs> so they sent me to uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency and I started seeing some of the new stuff and some of the things that were in the intelligence community. So that 497th job in the intelligence group, I was working new bombs, missiles and PGMs. And then they go, um, there's this new thing and it's going to be. Um, all special access program, you're going to get into all of those things. And I think what led me to that was I could pass a polygraph. I I mean, I grew up in this little town called Reedsville, North Carolina. And, um, you know, the first time I took a polygraph, they said, have you done drugs? I go, no. Have you done drugs? No. The guy goes, have you done drugs? 
no. And he turns off the machine because you've never done drugs. <laughs> I go, that's what I know. I'm from Reedsville. We'll get drugs in about 20 or 30 years. Yeah, yeah. But all kidding aside, that started getting me down to all of these special access programs. And every one of them was cooler and cooler and cooler. And I, you know, had a blast when, um, and I worked special programs during 9-11. And when President Bush said, uh, this is going to be unlike any war you've seen before. A lot of it is going to be in the shadows and you won't see what's doing. That's kind of where I was. And what was wonderful was um, there weren't very many people with those clearances. So I would usually go straight into the chairman's office and say, this just came in from the White House. We need to do X, Y, or Z. And he would do that. So then fast forward, we weren't talking about cyber. We just didn't talk about it. I was at the CIA and they said, congratulations, um, you're going to be a group commander. You're going to transition an intel group into the first attack squadrons for the Air Force. So um, that's how I did that. And then I stuck around to be the wing commander. But, um, you know, that realm is just, like you said, lots of excitement, lots of new ways of uh, thinking and doing things. So I was very, very excited to be able to jump into that at an early age captain, really. I will tell you, our airmen are amazing, amazing. And um, when you start pitching them into a fight that they really appreciate, and uh, sometimes, especially in cyber, when you change a one to a zero, they have, the overall group doesn't know what's going on. So I usually would charge our junior guys to do the math downrange and say, by the way, when you turn that one to a zero, bad guy X who wanted to blow himself up in the Mall of Americas is no longer with us. And then all of a sudden, everybody walks around with a big bow chest and they're very proud of what they do. And then it just starts snowballing and everybody's doing better and better things. And I tell this story often, but, you know, I walked in um, three o'clock in the morning and there was all kinds of math on. And just because cyber exists on another side of the planet, it was three in the morning and there's math on the board. And I go, what's what's up with all the math? And he goes, Oh, Airman so and so figured out how long we go to jail if we did this on the outside. <laughs> now, of course, everybody's kidding, but I mean, um, you know, those are those airmen that yeah. you, that are just rock stars, and you're so proud to be around them. And just like I was telling you about football, I wasn't the athlete. We had a bunch of rock stars I ran around with, and it was just a lot of fun to be a part of that organization. You're like tailor-made for your role right now. It seems like everything kind of fit into your ability and where you're at right now to be at the IFC. So when, you know, uh, the, the folks approach you, uh, Kaminsky and Fox and those folks approach you, what was it about this one that really made you say, yeah, that's where I want to spend So time. I will tell you, um, you know, relationships matter. And, you know, we, um, we have brothers and sisters across, you know, this piece. So, um, and, you know, when you call somebody a brother or sister, you may not mean it. Uh, most of the people I run around with really do mean it. So um, I got a phone call from General Clark, who was a teammate of mine. And um, he was also in 7th Squadron with me. So um, we've known each other for a very long time. I was still on active duty. And he goes, hey, brother, I need a favor. And I'm like, sure, brother, whatever you need. Don't answer the phone like that. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work well. Uh, but all kidding aside, he, you know, he, he said, because he and I have known each other, he goes, exactly what you said. Hey, I'm looking at all the things you did and what they want to do. This makes all the sense in the world. And, you know, really the major reason I came was a brother asked me to do something and um, I'd do anything for him. But what the IFC is doing is a, it's it's changing our mental model, right? It's it's out of those traditional uh, ways we think about academics, how we how we prepare our leaders. We're taking a little bit of different approach there. So what's that been like helping the academy transition to that new mindset? My focus had to be the dean, and the direction comes from the national defense strategy. So we actually have a meeting a week with the futures guys. Uh, and that gives us insight. But then going back and figuring out what we're going to put into the curriculum, we did a curricular review as soon as we got here. 
and I was joking and I said, okay, everybody knows word products. We're gonna do a universal insert delete. Every time you see ISIS and Al-Qaeda, it'll say Russia and China. But, but all kidding aside, that was kind of where we started rooting out some of the problems as we did. If I had a dean that didn't agree or believe, we'd be done a long time ago. But she's been wonderful. General Clark has been awesome, you know, facilitating all of this. And because we can go classify it or do anything else, it really starts, as you said, shifting the focus and saying, there is a reason why the Air Force Academy is different than an ROTC unit or a regular, you know, OTS or whatever. We're going to ingrain that across the board. This is basically teaching them you're a part of a much bigger, you know, orchestration and, um, Boy, it's a different way of thinking, but definitely gives you insight into how to do different things. You know, um, thinking two or three layers above when you're just in the cockpit, I don't understand why I'm doing this, but two or three layers above, I totally get it. Now I understand it. Well, and helping people see that connectedness to the larger system, right? Absolutely. So it's not, it may seem like I'm an independent person doing this, right. but it's part of that larger system. And and I still want you to independently be padlocked on that target and do all of that. But as opposed to grumbling, I don't understand why I'm doing this or the, the urgency of me doing this from the way that they're telling me, it totally makes larger sense as opposed to shut up and do it. We're Americans. We, we challenge everything. And honestly, I think that's what gives us the advantage over China or something else. We question everything. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Within context, right? That's okay. right. So what's it like from a, a leadership standpoint? Obviously, you led at the highest levels. This one's a little bit different. Maybe some more influence, sure. some more of those dotted lines and things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. What's it been to lead that organization through from the beginning to where it is now, from the big idea to to a concept? I really am not looking to take credit for anything. So whenever a future conflict thing comes off, we may have pulled lots of strings, but whoever's carrying it out or is involved, we try to push it. You know, well, look at what they did. Look at what they did. Because that makes the better team. And you know, sometimes I, I wince a little bit when they go, oh, well, the IFC did this. Well, actually, a lot of people did that. And, and when people go, well, you know, who is in the IFC? I, well, you know, who's studying under the IFC? Well, as I said, all three mission areas. Um, well, when did the IFC do this? Well, I mentioned first E-flag. Well, actually, that's not mine. That's the commandants. Uh, we've helped out, but it's commandants. An outstanding job. And I would never say, look at what the IFC did. But when you look at all of these different things where we'll bring speakers in, somebody else, or we'll fund, you know, some conference, um, you know, the donors may say, hey, BJ, what are you doing, you know, with this money? I can show them that it absolutely forwarded the future fight. It's giving the cadets great insight on that future fight. But somebody else may walk in and go, but that was my conference. And I will say, you're exactly right. And we are very proud for it. Obviously, we're sending out people who are competent in certain domains as an academic institution as well. But from a leadership standpoint, where are you seeing the value of the efforts of what the IFC and the larger team is doing on helping cadets understand their leadership and their role in leading that effort moving forward. Yeah, there's several, there's several things with that. So the first piece is making them aware of the threat. And, you know, the dean has introduced me and said, this is BJ Shue General Shueto, he's sowing evil minds. And, <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that the evil minds already exist. What we got to do is make them aware of the environment we're dumping them in. And a uh, case in point, I have one cadet, he raises his hand, like, you know, hypersonic missiles. I don't understand what's the big deal about that. And I go, okay, well, first of all, yes, they're fast. But as you remember from Physics 110, a ballistic missile trajectory is all mathematics. That's how the Patriot works. Hypersonic missiles can maneuver. So all your math is now dead. And go, oh, by the way, when you look down the range and you see all those antennas, NORAD, for the most part, was looking up to the north because the quickest way to get an ICBM to the United States was over the top. You can actually take a hypersonic missile, put it in a low Earth orbit, and that attack will come out of Antarctica. 
same cadet immediately raises his hand and goes, so the maneuvering is that RF command guy. And, and he's immediately trying to get into it. Right. And I'm like, I love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. honestly, when you start making them aware of the threats, they immediately start thinking countermeasures. So from the leadership standpoint, they understand that piece. Another thing we're teaching them is, and it's a snarky way of thing of saying it, but forget cylinders of excellence. And cylinders of excellence are during the global war on terrorism, we could show up in one cylinder of excellence, like I told you about the Predator or the Reaper, fire that missile, declare victory, and go home. If we're going to fight a great power competition or whatever, we are going to be in that situation where we need air, land, sea, space, cyber all showing up. So break down those cylinders. Um, and then the last part, part of this great power competition. We need to keep it at competition and not get to conflict. For the most part, we've been stuck at bombs, bullets, and beans in the spectrum of conflict. This is competition down here. This is conflict over here. And what we're teaching the cadets is, no, you got to participate across the board. And it may be heavy more in cyber or information operations, but you're going to use those tools all the way across the spectrum. But I really don't think our citizenry is ready for great power conflict. They're so used to us running up the score 100 to nothing that they don't understand what that is. And the Russians and Chinese on the competition scale have been running unopposed because we have been padlocked on ISIS and Al-Qaeda. So we're resetting their awareness so when they are future leaders, they make those impacts on the lower level. So we, just like I told you at the beginning, we never got to World War III. A lot of impact in a short amount of time. What are you hearing even anecdotally from them about that experience and that mindset and that ability to play at that level? Cadet walks up to me and goes, sir, I had no idea my country does this, but I want to do it really badly. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. you energize you know, that excitement. And then they come back and start telling all of these friends. I mean, you know, when I came here, I knew we were doing cool stuff, but being able to come back and see all of those things, boy, that makes me want to study more. That makes me want to get even better at whatever that buffet right. that, that well, I want to do. It is. And yeah. it's just a, one more thing that energizes me to make sure that I get it right. Well, and you put energized, passionate, yeah. excited cadets together and and you start talking about the ability to solve complex problems and, and have an influence on I, I used to call them evil bar napkins. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they come up with, you know, these great ideas. And it is humbling because they um, you know, they grew up a different way than I did. That's probably a lot more applicable to that future fight. And that is why so many people come to these guys. And that's why our research department gets someone so much money because they want to drag these guys in. I think we have more opportunities than we have cadets for research because they're so in demand. People understand how smart they are. If General Shuedo was Cadet Shuedo going through the academy right now, knowing what you know in terms of your trajectory and what you've learned over your time, and then knowing the opportunities that exist at the IFC and that, what would you tell yourself to think about as you were going through this process if you got off the bus uh, yeah. this summer to start all over? I, I would look up and say, you're very lucky. It's gonna, there are going to be times that it's going to suck. Yeah. You better be ready for that. Yeah. But I will tell you, it's worth, it's worth the fight. Um, you know, I've seen and done uh, very, very cool things that people will not know about for a very long time. And then the last part is because I just got off the bus and my head shaved and I'm pissed off at everybody. Suck it up. It's, it's worth the price of admission. But when you get out, honestly, all of this training, all of this, um, you know, experiences preps you for those, those future opportunities. So, General Shueto, as a student of military history and a teacher of leadership, um, and, and there's a question that we often like to ask just based on people's experience, are, um, in your opinion, are, are leaders born or are they made? You know, it's funny. Um, I often get the question, you know, hey, is there a book that you really advocate for leadership? And I just kind of smile and go, look, leadership, just like I was telling you with the coaching and all that other stuff, leadership is all about working with people. And you've got to understand people. And it's a little more work than that. Just like you said, I need to find the positives. I need to see what you as a person 
excites you, what motivates you. And then when I was telling you facilitate the positives and negate the negatives. And I believe part of that when you say, is it born or is it, you know, um, I think people are born with the capability to get to know you a lot better, but it does come back to motivating you and finding where I can put you in that situation that you're gonna excel, just like we were talking about earlier, and then keep you out of those situations where you may not perform. That is kind of the one-on-one -on -one leadership. Well, how do you, you know, right? Well, it's a pyramid organization by design. So you find leaders that also go along those lines, and then when I have a problem, I go down that pyramid along those lines. But I think it's, it would be pretty sad if you're either a leader or not. I do believe that if you're not very good at figuring out people, et cetera, you can eventually learn that, but it is easier for some than others. That's kind of, it. leadership is definitely motivating people and understanding, understanding what motivates those guys. You know, uh, Patton used to say, I, I don't measure the merits of my company commanders by the calluses on their ass. And what he's saying is, get out. And you do need to get out there and you know motivate, understand, talk to the talk to the folks. And f for you know here and everywhere else, because our airmen are so amazing, it's actually one of the best parts of the day. And some of these guys are just denying them that opportunity. And within the context of of warfare, um, obviously we you've mentioned this earlier that we've seen the world change and conflict in the 21st century doesn't take place in what we think in traditional areas uh, like the battlefield. So what advice would you like to offer the generation coming up behind uh, you and us that that want to be warriors, that maybe want to join the long blue line and and want to become leaders? For the future fight. I, I will tell you, you know, fundamentally, as I said before, it's a lot different than global war on terrorism and, you know, some of these other pieces. But what I'm seeing, especially with technologies, is the rise of the third parties. So when it comes to cyber, we've watched the Ukraine where these third party cyber gangs are now playing. And, you know, when you look at the Russian <laughs> cyber capability where the Russian government stops and the Russian ma mafia begins is not a real good fine line. And we're seeing some of these guys pitch into the fights. When I'm talking to the cadets, I'm like, you can ignore this, but you'll do it at your own peril. And more disconcerting, a lot of these well-intentioned people that may think that they're helping the fight, there was one report where they had gotten into the space systems of the Russians and they had the ability to turn off the satellites. Well, in a nuclear scenario in first strike, making your adversary blind before you do that is a precursor. And sometimes countries don't want their missiles stuck in holes. So when they start seeing all of those warnings go, they launch in the other direction. So these well-intentioned people could cook off a much larger campaign. So I tell the cadets, you cannot ignore these capabilities. Another one is drones. I mean, um, Richard Clark, who's a SOCOM, was a previous SOCOM commander, quite rightly pointed out that a bomb has not fallen on U.S. troops since 1953. These drones that we're seeing, and um, you know, they are blowing up tanks. Uh, they have pushed the Black Sea Fleet out of port. Um, you know, we've seen all of this, and fundamentally, you're going. Okay, how do we counter that? And can we promise that a bomb will not fall on there with F-22s and F-35s? Back to those evil minds, they start looking on those countermeasures. But we're dumping them fundamentally in a much different environment than what their teachers fought in the global war on terrorism. So we've got to equip them with all of those capabilities. And then the last part with those drone drivers and the cyber folks. They may not lie, look like a battle dress uniform. They may look, you know, like somebody. And oh, by the way, they probably can't run, you know, the two mile run or anything like that. But they're still effective on the battlefield. And you need to understand that when we go forward. As you've led at different levels, you've obviously learned a lot of lessons along the way. What are some of the maybe a couple of other kind of key takeaways you've learned about leadership? I think the lesson is don't forget who you are. You know, I wasn't born a general. I very much was scrubbing toilets, you know, up on the hill. And I think going back to don't forget who you are, 
and being able to, you know, hey, now there were there were times when we were shoveling shit. I, I I have learned, you know, back to getting to know the, your people. Um, show up when it's crappy. Um, don't show up only when it, it is convenient for you. So, but you showed that, hey, I love you because I'll show up, you know, when it is. And it really is never forget who you are. I mean, you know, um, you sure as hell wouldn't get that vote <laughs> when you were second lieutenant. So it's not going to change your life too much. And I think people understand when you really care about them. You know, and if you care about them, they'll do what, you know, whatever needs to be done. And the last part is, and P, and my airmen used to roll their eyes. It, of course, you were, you were on the hook for the vision and for the battle plan. But as I said before, these are amazing airmen and they will do whatever needs to be done to win that fight. But I'd often tell them when they were, you know, struggling, look, I work for you. I'm removing your impediments so you can do the, you know, kill the bad guys. And, you know, I've made a career out of playing practical jokes on bad guys because these guys were really good at it. But when I'd say I work for you, they'd roll their eyes. But eventually they understood that if there wasn't enough gas here or if there wasn't, remove those impediments so they can do that. And hell, that was something that I did as a lieutenant, a captain. I've been pretty good at it, you know, up to this point. So. And, and it really helps that value proposition. They feel like they really are part of a team. They, they value, they matter, regardless of the of the level of the organization. Absolutely. And, you know, to understand and, you know, the military, uh, you know, on the Army side, you know, the leaders eat last. I, I, I've got numerous Army brothers. I don't like talking about it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but all kidding aside, there's a lesson there. Yeah. And, you know, be humble and understand that you really do work for those guys because they are doing the mission. And... Uh, once you do that, and once they understand that they no lie will remove those impediments and no lie they do care about you, you'll be amazed what kind of feats that you'll see happen on the other end. Well, thank you for that uh, perspective. Yeah. Any final thoughts or anything we didn't talk about that you want to talk no, about? No, I can't thank you guys enough for the opportunity. And, um, you know, uh, asking about the Institute for Future Conflict, honestly, everything they've done has nothing to do with me <laughs> and everything to do with this this command team here because they have given me all the opportunities from General Clark, the dean, the, you know, the comm and the Department of Athletics. And people kind of have a furrowed brow. Yes, we have we have a focus on the Department of Athletics, too. So thanks for the opportunity so I can share with you with all the great things they're doing to make uh, our cadets ready for that future fight. Well, appreciate that and appreciate your example and what you're doing with that. If people want to connect with you or get in touch with the, the IFC and find out kind of what's going on, what's the best way for them Absolutely. to do that? Absolutely. So um, if you just Google Institute for Future Conflict, it'll come up. And then on the bottom, you'll see a couple of lieutenants' names. Um, Luckily, uh, and, and I tease them all the time, I go, I compare and contrast me coaching football and teaching boxing and unarmed combat and what you're getting here, <laughs> two different worlds. But they often are the ones that we tease them and go, they're the real bosses of the IFC. They'll get back to us on what we need to do or to answer questions or anything along those lines. That's great. And I know that the uh, Checkpoints magazine has a three-part series that's coming out that uh, kind of amplifies some of the people and some of the team members that you built on there Absolutely. that you mentioned uh, as well today. Looking forward to that. So lastly, there's not that many Shuedos in the global. You can find me fairly quickly. That's, that's great. Well, we thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you for your, uh, your legacy. Thank you for all that you're doing for the Academy. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thank you for listening to Long Blue Leadership. If you enjoyed this episode, we encourage you to subscribe, share it with your family and friends, and post it to your social channels. Long Blue Leadership is a production of the Long Blue Line Podcast Network and presented by the U.S. Air Force Academy Association and Foundation. The views and opinions of the guests and hosts do not necessarily reflect those of the United States Air Force, Air Force Academy, Academy Association and Foundation, its staff or management. The podcast drops every two weeks on Tuesday mornings. Subscribe to Long Blue Leadership on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn Plus Alexa, and all your favorite podcast platforms. Search at Air Force Grads on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and more for show announcements and updates. And visit longblueleadership.org for past episodes and more Long Blue Line Podcast Network programming.